Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for letting me have the opportunity to speak with uh, the group today. Um, I've been at the University of Minnesota for actually 20 years, uh, as of last month. And I've been working with transplant patients for that entire time frame, and probably know a fair number of you. Um, I joke with my fellows as I train them that in my years there, I've done over 10,000 right heart catheterizations at the uh, medical center there. So I probably have tapped into a few of the necks of the patients on this uh, conference. I initially started this presentation with the bare essentials for the fellows. And I received questions from Glenn uh, that show that a large number of you are more than competent, maybe doing more than some of our trainees. And so I had to kind of upscale the presentation. So at any point, if you want to send messages via chat to Glenn, I can stop. And I'll kind of skip around a little bit uh, and try not to bore you. I've got about 60 slides, but some pictures here and there. So with that, I'll go forward. I have no conflicts of interest. One second. There we go. So we're going to talk about the procedures, uh, cardiac catheterization, uh, hemodynamic measurements, which involve both right heart catheterization and left heart catheterization. I'll explain those to you. Angiography, which can be imaging of the coronary arteries, the left ventricle, the aorta, or in certain cases, patients who've had bypass, either pre or post transplant of the grafts to their vessels. Um, Additional procedures that we'll discuss are lesion assessment, where we do intravascular ultrasound. That's actually part of the workup for the cardiac transplant patients. They get in on day 30 with the new heart, and then the follow-up study is done at one year, so we can do a comparison, as well as fractional flow reserve, which was where we measure gradients or pressure across narrowings. And I'll discuss briefly what we do in cath when we start trying to fix vessels, the angioplasty, stenting, whether it be with bare metal or the drug eluting sense we've had for the last 15 years, as well as atherectomy, which is we drill out the artery. And then finally, left ventricular support. Just because of the content here, I held off on LVADs. That's really its own talk in itself. But I will discuss balloon pumps because a fair number of you have either seen that or been exposed to it. So let's just start with why might you have a cardiac catheterization, not necessarily from the standpoint of a transplant patient. Um, the first is suspected or known coronary artery disease. Somebody who comes in with unstable angina where they're having chest pain. Sometimes it's part of a preoperative evaluation. For some patients, it may be because they have silent ischemia that's picked up on a stress study of some sort but not even having symptoms. In other patients, it may be directly from a stress study, either an exercise study or a pharmacologic study, such as a stress echo or a stress nuclear. And then finally, for patients with atypical chest pain, or uh, coronary spasm. We also do it in patients who have myocardial infarction, which is another way of facing a heart attack. In those patients, we open up the vessel primarily with coronary intervention. Some patients have chest pain after they've had the heart attack and present late. Those patients go to cath lab. Rescue angioplasty is when someone's opened up the artery, or I should say, the artery was failed to open, for example, with thrombolytic therapy patients who are transferred in from another medical center where they may have gotten thrombolytic therapy so they didn't have this opportunity to go to the cath lab. Cardiogenic shock. Unfortunately, some of you have already seen this. This is a situation where you have a very weak heart muscle and we're doing what we can to try to preserve the heart to save a life. And then for mechanical complications, which are very interesting, but can be catastrophic. Um, other indications are sudden cardiac death where somebody has been resuscitated and looking to see what the cause was of their sudden cardiac death. Valvular heart disease, where we're measuring gradients across the valves. Congenital heart disease for patients who are born with uh, defects in their heart and we're trying to identify what they are to figure out how they can be surgically or percutaneously corrected. Aortic dissection, I just had one of these on Friday, um, where a patient has a dissected aorta. In the case I had on Friday, um, the patient had type A or section and an aneurysm, but the surgeon needed to know whether or not he had to do a bypass at the same time he did the dental procedure to repair the aorta. Um, for pericardial pathology, which is the sac around the heart, cardiomyopathy, which is what everyone on this video conference is familiar with, this is how it ultimately ends before you get the transplant with the weak heart muscle. And then as part of pre and post cardiac transplant, which I'll try to focus on here. 
who should get it? I used to say there were contraindications to a cardiac cath, but after 20 years, I can tell you pretty much anybody can get it uh, as long as I can find a way of getting into a vessel. Relative contraindications are listed here. Um, in general, these are patients who we may want to think twice before we do it. For example, somebody's having GI bleed and they're having a heart attack, but I can't get them aspirin or Plavix. That's going to be a hard thing to get into because they'll clot off the stent. Um, other issues include anticoagulation, where we have to be cautious about access, fever, because we don't want to have, if we're putting it in a device, to have it get infected. If a patient's had a recent stroke, putting them on a blood thinner can be a risk. So we always weigh the benefits and the risks with the patients. One of the things we probably don't do an excellent job of because of the time crunch is talking to patients beforehand, but hopefully with our nurse practitioners and our mid-levels now, you have the opportunity to ask questions to the provider to make sure your questions are addressed and you understand the risks and the benefits. But there are high risk conditions where we have to be very careful, like somebody who has a left main stenosis, um, extensive three vessel disease, if they have severe narrowing of their aortic valve, severe heart failure or low ejection fracture, all of these are significant negative prognosticators which suggest a bad outcome. Diabetes, advanced stage, and then an acu anything acute. If somebody's coming with a heart attack or unstable angina, you're kind of working on the clock, moving really quickly, trying to save heart muscle. Those increase the risk as well. Aortic aneurysm does, as does stroke. Patients with kidney disease, because contrast is nephrotoxic and hurts the kidneys, are at increased risk. Obesity, primarily because it makes it more difficult to access patients, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes, as well as high blood pressure, because both of the latter two increase the risk of bleeding. The complications, these are quite a Number, the risk of death is about one in a thousand. The, death, the risk of a heart attack is even less than that. Um, and the death, the risk of stroke is also about one in a thousand. I still say less than 1% because these are ideal numbers and you know, it depends on the substrate who you're taking care of. Arrhythmia is less than half a percent. Vascular injury, and we've seen higher numbers than we like. We're always focusing on this. And I'll talk about some of these with you. Um, that T should be an E for embolism. Um, those include fistula, pseudoaneurysms, clotting or thrombosis, and where the clot travels, which is called an embolism, as well as aortic dissection from tearing the aorta. Allergic reaction, which is very, very rare, but we can address it when it needs to be fit and we premedicate for it. And then vasovagal reactions, particularly when the sheath is being pulled. For diabetics, just so you know, our management of these patients is to hold glucophage, although it can be given on the same day. It's particularly important to uh, not give it for the two days afterwards. Now, this next issue is a very good one, and I actually sent a message and called Cindy Martin last night because I'm a little bit different than my colleagues. I tell patients to drink before the procedure because if you're dehydrated, the veins collapse, and it makes it harder for the fellow to make access to the vessel. We always point out against this because it's the procedure, the protocol, the hospital, or anything the procedure. Insufficiency is a problem because patients that are transplanted are on immunosuppressive drugs and things that hurt the kidneys. And so that's not for patients. So it's always about minimizing contrast. There is no proven therapy other than making sure a patient's hydrated appropriately to ensure that they don't have injury to the kidneys, which is another reason why I encourage patients to drink water. One second. This is T, not a sea breeze, just so you know. And I will call. <laughs> um, anti drugs and anticoagulants. Uh, CBC prior to the procedure, which is a complete blood count. Uh, we continue the aspirin and Plavix, and we stop Coumadin typically three to five days before. There are some patients who build Coumadin. The procedure is urgent. One thing I don't want to do in general is a biopsy while somebody's on it because a biopsy in general is a lot. 
a bit of phylactery reaction. It's almost like an anaphylaxis or when patients get itching, um, break out to a rash, get flushed, angioedema, swelling in their mouth or the ringeal duty, that can be a true medical emergency. And when you see those kinds of effects, the pulmonary, the cardiac effects, particularly when a patient develops hypertension, that's when we have an emergency. I've only seen this a few times in my 27 years of practice and training that I can count them probably on one to two hands. Um, we pre-medicate patients with a no allergy. Allergy to shellfish uh, is not a reason, although those patients have a higher incidence of being allergic to other foods and medications. We do not pre-medicate for that, but we give Benadryl prednisone before. If they come to the hospital that day, they have not been pre-medicated, but we still need to do the procedure. We'll get IV Benadryl and IV Salubendrol, the intravenous steroid equivalent. So welcome to the cath lab. This is, these are pictures. I tried to be appropriate and give references where possible, but images.google.com doesn't really give that. So some of these are lifted, I apologize. This is just general cardiac cath lab. Cath labs, this is a hybrid aura. We actually have this on the floor above that. Fortunately, none of you have ever seen this. You've had your actual cardiac surgery. Um, this is a much larger room, more spacious. These rooms are billions of dollars. And where space is tight, this is hard. We're actually installing new hybrid rooms that started last week in what was room five. Uh, so we're going to have biplane there as well. On the left-hand side, we have single-plane angiography. On the right-hand side, we have biplane angiography. And so the advantage of biplane, which we do on some of the patients that are listening today, are in patients with kidney dysfunction because I can take two images at the same time during a diagnostic procedure and use half as much contrast. It takes longer. It's a little bit more difficult, so we don't do it in general. But when the GFR typically is approaching 30, that's where we get more careful. If you ever have a concern about your kidney function, you talk to your doctor before you have the procedure. So yeah, there are a few people with kidney issues beyond myself that are on this today. So uh, that's, that's good information to have. Uh, good. I know that's been a concern for some as well. So thank you. Just briefly so that some of, there were people here that had interest in, in the physics. What do we do? Well, x-rays are generated in this vacuum tube that the radiation just, you know, comes from underneath you goes up and hits the flat plate detector. It used to be called an imaging intensifier, but now it's kind of like the equivalent of a modern day TV screen with the LCD panel. Essentially, the, the energy comes from a generator outside of the room where you see, because you have to convert AC to DC energy, because electrons have to move one direction. And that happens in the x-ray tube that's underneath the table that swings on that C arm, the thing that moves around you. Essentially, the cathode is boiled up to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and the electrons boil off is we pump voltage through there, it increases the number of photons, and we also can increase the voltage, and that increases the depth or how much they go through. They go through the patient, but a very small proportion of them actually do what they're supposed to do. Most of them bounce off and hit us. That's the reason we're always at increased risk of cancer and radiation exposure as our patients. You get this once in a while. We deal with this every day. That's the reason we're wearing lead and using uh, the shields in these cases. And there's increasing technology being looked at to try to make this. And I will tell you, in about five years, it's going to be a whole different world. There may come a time with some of the new technology where we don't have to wear that uh, at all in the cardiac cath lab. The way this is created is called Brumsterlung radiation. And Brumsterlung is German for breaking. And this is because the electrons hit the other side of the tube underneath you, which is made of copper. And the electrons are attracted to the nucleus and they slow down. And as they do that, X-rays are given off, and the X-rays are what pass through you onto the flat plate detector. That essentially converts to an electrical signal. And that's how we get our images. We do something called fluoroscopies, which is where we're just tapping on the camera and looking, and then we do city angiography, which involves a higher dose, and the city angiograms are what are stored. It used to be film, 35 millimeter film, and now it's stored on DICOM images. This slide I put in specifically at the request of one of the patients. And I'm going to tell you, because I wrote to my staff college saying, I'm only telling you my perspective. So you can quote me, but not the medical center of this, because I didn't have a chance to vet this in due time. But this is the way I look at this. Um, the University of Minnesota is an academic medical center, and one of its core missions is to train future cardiologists. In other words, if we didn't do what we did, then people would go out, and they wouldn't have adequate training and put patients in this. 
The General Cardiology Fellowship or Cardiovascular Fellowship is three years. And during that time, fellows are trained, and at the end of that, they should be able to perform diagnostic procedures independently. For those fellows, they're interested in doing more than that, such as angioplasty, stenting, intervention procedures, there's a fourth year. And now there's actually a fifth year structural fellowship for those who are interested in doing the high tech stuff, such as percutaneous valves, um, atrial septal defect repair, some of the cooler things, the new micro valve technology that's coming to the United States. Our highest priority is quality of care, which means both good outcomes and high quality safety. The staff cardiologist, which is myself, is the attending physician or the faculty at the University of Minnesota, and it's our responsibility to supervise the procedures, and we're ultimately responsible for what happens in the case, as, um, as you probably already know. The fellows in the earlier years require closer supervision, but it's variable, and a senior fellow or a staff cardiologist typically scrubs. I'll often be on the other side of the glass. If it's a senior fellow or an interventional fellow, you'll hear me on the speaker barking at a fellow. In general, I don't shout or scream unless I'm extremely irritated. And I'll come in there because I don't want to upset a patient and say, would you mind not doing this or that? Um, but I want to make sure that they're doing things. And I'm watching like a hawk, which is important. Um, the senior fellows obviously have more independence and the interventional fellows have the greatest events. Essentially, they're, they're finished their fellowship of fourth year, so they could do this and just go out, but they choose to stay fourth year, and they eventually, they take their boards in the fall, like coming up next month, and so they're actually gonna be board certified, and they could do this without me watching, but because of the financials and the way the university works, we still supervise. A patient comfort and satisfaction are of paramount importance, and you should share their experience with the staff. So I've got, without getting into all the details, I've gotten stuck in my neck and had a right heart cath equivalent done. So I know what it feels like. So I tend to be a little bit more tender with patients. I think that, you know, everyone's different. All the doctors are different. All the fellows are different. All the faculty are different. So I can't speak for everyone. But I try to be a little bit more ginger with the needle going in because, you know, personally, I don't like needles. And so I know it's like you get stuck in your neck and I don't want someone sticking the bone or doing the artery or doing something wrong. And I'll tell patients beforehand. And one of the questions that came out is um, whether or not a fellow should be doing the procedure. And so I'm trying to give you the long and short of this without committing to a yes or a no. But what I would say is the final way I go about this is that if a patient has a concern about a prior experience or having a fellow participate in the procedure, simply talk to the staff. In general, if it's me, if you see a fellow involved, I'll say, okay, let me know why. So I have an understanding you need to be able to correct that. Um, I do know that the transplant patients talk about themselves. If somebody has bad experience, it's kind of like, uh, I don't know, like Charlie Brown's, like everybody in the family knows. So I know that the next patient's going to say, oh, when Dr. X did it, they did this or that. So we want to make sure that we identify the problems that the other patients don't have that experience. And hopefully I've, I've done well with the patients in general. If I haven't, then you guys need to let me know. Yeah. Dr. Berger, let me add, if I might, uh, two, sure. two points. Uh, yeah, your, your suspicions are correct. You know, a heart transplant, as well as LVAD patients, you know, we have our weekly get togethers. And so, so that's, you know, people do, do share what's on their mind. And, and so, you know, every, you know, the entire gamut and, you know, someone may have uh, had one experience or another. And I think I can speak for the group in saying that we try to say, you know, you need to bring, you need to raise that because without knowledge obviously you guys want to do the best but but you don't know it unless you get the feedback and so um so because of that two things one i can say firsthand I, you know i have an open dialogue with folks and i always know i'm a little goofy in that but, but uh i encourage folks i think you would as well uh to have that open dialogue uh and two i don't know about anybody else's experience but boy do i get surveys after every single cath lab and I started filling out in the past, but 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 then I had so many, and I was like, well, if I have something to say, I'll say it. But I I haven't, you know, probably in the last year. Um, but I encourage everybody. That's a, I know that that's a great opportunity for you to provide direct feedback. If you're not comfortable speaking of it in person, at least you can write it in your survey, uh, knowing that that's one of your processes. Yeah, I don't even know if I see the surveys in all honesty. So I'd rather just hear it directly. You know, no one's gonna hurt my feelings. Uh, that's the reason. Great. All right, Thank we'll turn back on you there. Go right ahead. <laughs> Thanks. So we give conscious sedation. This was also a question that was asked. We use a combination of versus and fentanyl. One of the questions that came up was, 
Uh, some of the patients, <coughs> it's probably about 10% say, listen, I want sedation no matter what. And I resist that. And I'll tell you why. <coughs> I believe that if I do this procedure carefully, even for the most anxious patient, I can pretty much alleviate the anxiety. And I'm really speaking, having done many, many of these cases. The two issues that come up. One is the risk of sedation is higher than the benefit that's obtained in terms of alleviation of anxiety. Um, if my chance of having a complication is one in 1,000 to one in 10,000, I can't say that respiratory depression will not be causing more than that. And I don't want to cause risk. The second is that when patients sleep, they're kind of knocked out, especially patients with pulmonary hypertension. In my experience, the pressure is kind of simmer down. So I may not be simulating what it is when you're awake, and I may get false lower numbers. So I'm concerned that I may not be seeing quote real numbers. And that's the reason I've chosen that. Now, I do have three patients in the transplant population who are off the bell curve and outside the 95% distribution where I've yielded on that. But I'll just let you know that's my practice. Um, so what do we do? I'm just going to explain some of the basics to you. The patients are laid down on their back as opposed to IR procedures, interventional radiology, they go supine or prune. And then we choose the access site. That can either be the right or left internal jugular vein of your neck, the brachial vein, which we use on occasion, um, as well as the right or left femoral vein, which is where we used to do it all. And then the artery used to be the femoral artery, but now for about 10 to 12 years, I have to go back and check, I've been using radial artery where possible. And we do a sterile prep. So this is an example of what we do. And can you see my mouse? Just not perfect, thank you. So this is the carotid artery. This is the vein. We come from here down with the needle, and you can see the vein with ultrasound. I do ultrasound on every one of my patients, everyone. Um, I can't say everyone does. It used to be that we did to on any of them, but simply put, it reduces, it makes it higher likelihood that you're going to get the vein because you can see what you're doing. If you don't, you're just looking at the skin like this. It's sticking in, going well. This is where it's when I get blood back, but you can hit the carotid artery. So we put the needle at an angle, and through that needle goes a wire. And I'll explain to you about that more. When we go with a leg, there's an acronym called NABEL, N-A-B-E-L, like a nerve, artery, vein, and then lymphatics. And so we look for certain landmarks by looking at the hip, and where these landmarks are right here. And we're essentially going right about here, where we stick the needle. But sometimes the superficial femoral artery branches out higher or lower and you can get complications. We put these tubes in over the wire, then pull out the dilator. You're left with this sheath in you. And through this sheath, we can insert tubes and we can also flush it and pull back blood. So what about complications? I hesitated about telling you this. I feel like there's probably a lawyer to it here, but I want to be transparent. So not all these cases are uh, free of complications. Bleeding is actually one of our biggest complications we have to deal with. Hematoma is where you get a collection of blood under the skin. It's not the way it looks. That's called ectomosis or that bluish discoloration. Hematoma is actually you, something you palpate, you feel. All of you have had cases done. At some point, you probably had a hematoma. Some are small, some are big. We try to keep this complication rate below 2%. But in all honesty, if you ever say our numbers have been higher, it's related to the substrate patients. It's related probably to the fact that we do training. It's related to the complexity of the care that we do and the types of procedures that we do, lots of different things. And I'm the director of quality of care for our site, so I review all these. In fact, to give you an idea of how much effort I put in quality of care, well, some of you probably enjoy Labor Day weekend. I spent it looking at every single patient who got readmitted with a heart attack between July of 2019 and June 30th of 2020 and reviewed every single chart and their readmission, did an abstract of every case and we'll be presenting that data. So I want you to know I really am interested in quality. I'm gonna show you what pseudoaneurysm and a fistula is in the next two lines. This is bad. Here's the artery where the blood should be. You see this needle like a golf ball? This is blood that escaped out called a pseudoaneurysm. We can compress these more and more now with an ultrasound probe to eliminate this, but if they're large, over two centimeters, sometimes they need surgical repair. Fortunately, this is uncommon. The other one is the AV fistula. This is the femoral artery, which we're injecting with a tube. This is the femoral vein. You shouldn't see this, but in this case, the needle was stuck from the artery into the vein because of where this patient's vein came off. So if you stick an A 
you're getting a branch of that vein. I know it's just unfortunate. And so you go through the vein, the artery, and then you're left with a connection between the two. So blood goes down the artery, through that hole, and then up the vein. And that's called an AV fistula. Similar to the AV fistula, it's potentially in dialysis patients. So here's an example of a femoral artery access with the tube shown here. Here's radial access. I do all my cases radial. Some of my colleagues will go through the ulnar artery, which is shown down here, right here. And I'll talk to you a little bit about each of these. This is the request of one of the people who's joining today. Pros and cons. So femoral access is how I was trained. And I trained in the 1990s and then no one was doing radial. It was easy. You can get back into the artery and over and over again. It's not going to close. You put in large tubes. The catheters that we use are preformed and therefore they fit into the coronaries, like just by pushing them up, they slide in there easily. And there's less radiation exposure. You're further away from the patient. The cons or the complications include bleeding and vascular complications that we talked about. As well as it takes longer to get up two hours if you're not anything regulated. If you are four hours with a closure device, we have to be careful. Radial access, the biggest issue is reduced bleeding and reduced vascular complications. I can tell you with 100%, if I go through a person's radial artery and I complete the procedure successfully, you're not going to have a femoral artery complication. Simple as that. Radial complications are less frequent. It's more comfortable for patients, but it uh, also allows early regulation and obviates the discontinuation of anticoagulants. In other words, you're less likely to have a major vascular complication. We use a special radial band that goes on the wrist after these procedures. But access is more challenging. There is a little bit more higher radiation exposure for us as the doctors. There are fewer catheter options, and um, it may preclude a radial graft. I actually haven't tested that, but for patients who have bypass, sometimes the surgeon uses a radial artery. It's very uncommon. But in diabetics, for example, where we're trying to get all arterial grafts to keep them open, the radial artery may get used. If you've been putting a hole through and you close off the artery, that's more likely. The closure rate for these grafts occurs somewhere around 4 to 5%. Oftentimes, you don't know. Even if you close the artery, your own artery, which is, tends to be the dominant artery, takes over. And so you may not even be aware of it until we go back and try to get into the artery again. But that is complication. So what do we do? We, the venous sheath provides access to the right side of the heart. And the arterial sheath provides access to the left side of the heart. Wires are inserted into the sheaths and advance to the aorta to the level coronary arteries. And diagnostic coronary catheters are then inserted into the sheath over the wire and positioned in the coronary ostium, or the opening to see the vessels. We measure pressures as we advance the catheter through the heart. And several of you asked how we do this, so I'm going to show you that. And as we move the catheter from each chamber to chamber, we measure the pressure. And this permits also the identification of a gradient or a sudden change in pressure as we cross the heart valve. Patients who have a stenosis, for example, the aortic valve or the pulmonic valve, the pressure will suddenly drop, and that means we've got a problem. This is a right heart catheterization, which we do either coming from the leg or the internal jugular. And then we go into each of these chambers, that's the black tube, or from the brachial vein. So you come from the internal jugular, the brachial vein, or the right femoral vein. This is actually kind of cool. I should start doing this more and more because then you don't have to get your neck stuck, and this is really easy, but it's hard to find this vein. So we actually have the people who put in IVs, they can put in a little IV in this brachial vein here, the brachial, uh, the basilic vein right here, and then if they do that in a sterile fashion, and I don't have to do a biopsy, because I'm not gonna do a biopsy this way, but if I do it, I can do the right heart cath, and just pop it in this way, and then never even stick your neck. So I may start doing more of these. One of my colleagues is doing these outside the university. All right, so that's the veins. We measure pressures, and as we go in there, the first pressure we measure is the right atrial pressure. And this has this up-down, up-down configuration as the atrium contracts. Then we pass the catheter into the right ventricle, and we see this right ventricular pressure. And then up through the pulmonic valve, and we see the pulmonary artery pressure. For the doc, not many of you have, but for patients who have pulmonary hypertension, if we see that elevated pressure, um, that could be a problem. Uh, those are patients that see Kurt Prins, Mark Prisker in particular, or uh, Thenapy. They do, they're a pulmonary hypertension specialist at the university. And then we advance the catheter and put a balloon up right here. That's called the wedge pressure. When we do that, we're indirectly seeing the pressure on the other side, which is on the other side of the lungs, which is the pulmonary veins, 
which is an estimate of the left atrium and the left ventricle. So we're indirectly seeing the left ventricular pressure in somebody who doesn't have valvular disease on this side without having to stick the, the artery. And so that's the right heart cath. When we do a left heart cath, Actually, we go quick, up. I can ask, yeah. uh, because it's something I know I've run into and I've talked to others that uh, in some of our notes we compare. Uh, with a wedge pressure, you did a great job of explaining actually all of this. It's absolutely fascinating. Uh, and my understanding is, you know, we can get an idea of how much fluid, the, you know, that we might be retaining. Certainly, you work with uh, uh, heart failure, but even post-heart failure, you know, it's, it's, what is it about that that you just described does indicate the fluid imbalance? Yeah, so we measure each of these pressures. If the right atrial pressure shown here is above 8, that's abnormal. On the left side, 12. Those are the pressures we're looking at. And then the mean pulmonary pressure, which is not the up-down, but there's a line that averages over it. The new definition for that is 20. 20 is mild, 35 is moderate, 45 is severe. So we have certain parameters that we look at and then we report those out. So we also look at cardiac output. In oxygen saturations, we draw a sample of blood in the pulmonary artery. A low PA saturation is bad, very bad. The lower it is, the worse it is. And that can signify cardiac, uh, cardiogenic shock. And we look at the cardiac output, which is also goes into the estimate for the PA saturation and the oxygen saturation. And that gives us an idea of whether your heart's pumping. But what cardiac output, I remember this because when I was a medical student in the operating room holding a retractor, my cardiac surgeon was cutting into a chest uh, in uh, 1988. He said to me, uh, Dr. Berger, what is normal cardiac output? Or, I'm sorry, uh, what, is, uh, what is the normal intravascular volume in your heart? And I looked up with a smile on my face and said, I have no idea, sir. He goes, well, I'll tell you what. Your cardiac output is simply as a minute. In the minute I've been having this conversation, you just bled to death. You can pass the retractor to the student on your left and leave the room now. And after that, I never forgot the normal cardiac output is. So cardiac volume is about five to six, and your output is six liters a minute, and that's the reason... If somebody severs a major artery, you bleed to death within a minute or two. So FYI, you learned it without having to see the surgeon. Left heart catheterization, uh, shown here. Now we go in through a radial artery. The brachial artery I don't ever use because it causes complications. And if you close the brachial artery off, you lose all the blood flow to the distal arm. The femoral artery uh, is what we typically use. Um, I'm pretty much a radialist. You'll notice if you've worked with me over the years, my colleagues now are going more and more over, but I'm probably over 80 to 90 percent uh, radial access, unless a patient says not to, or a dialysis patient who has a fistula. And I'll really try hard to get into that radial artery. If some patients, if they've had bad experience, will say, listen, doc, next time just do it uh, from the leg, but it's nice not to have vascular complications. Okay. One of you asked me about biopsy, so I had this yesterday. This is a biotome, and this is the heart image graphic with the catheter going in through the right atrium from the neck. We can also go in from the inferior vena cava from below and go up like this and down through the tricuspid valve. Then we bend it, and we try to get this. Now, in all honesty, we're not always sure where we are. If we really, really, really need to know, like on a native heart, um, you need to do echo guys. So you might say, well, why don't you do that for all of them? It takes time and it takes effort. And most of the patients with transplants have hypertrophy hearts. In my 20 years, I've had, I believe, one perf. It was on a patient, and that happened actually four days later, which is very, very odd. And that was it. So my number is very, very low. Uh, this is the biotome going through the tricuspid valve, touching the septum. We open the biotome and then pull the lever. You can't see it. You only see it under floor. It looks just like this. And then we take out these little small pieces, and then they come under a microscope. And when they do, they look for both cellular rejection and humoral rejection. So without looking and memorizing all this stuff, zero is good, three R is bad. The higher the number, the worse it is, okay? This is by looking at the slides and looking for infiltrates and whether there's tissue damage. The second thing we do is anybody DNA rejection, and that's just classic zero or one. Once again, one is bad, zero is good. So an antibody BA rejection of zero, and an ACR or acute cellular rejection of zero, all is good. And most of my patients have that. The antibody BA rejection is essentially based on 
the uh, human world factors. They look at the CD4 and do immunohistochemistry, really high tech stuff. All right, how do we do coordinated geography? Well, I've already talked to you about how we do a cardiac cath. A cardiac cath means we're just putting a catheter into the ventricles of the heart. A coronary angiogram means we're taking pictures of coronary arteries, so they're not the same. Although we simply say, what do you have in your cardiac cath? Um, we use ionic and non-ionic contrast. In general, now it's all non-ionic. The X-ray B passes through this, and the reason we use iodinated contrast is that iodine falls into that area where X-rays hit it, and it bounces off and causes a dark spot on your flat plate factor, so we can see something. So coronary vessels appear opaque against the dark background. And real-time images are important as these city integrants, as I said earlier, and they're digitally stored in something like a DICOM format. So essentially, whether your lab is a Phillips lab or a G or Siemens or Toshiba, now as opposed to the way it used to, we had proprietary software, patients get frustrated and walk around with CDs that could be read by other doctors, these images can be pushed from one place to another. So here are the coronary arteries of a heart that's been uh, taken out. The red are the coronary arteries, and I'm going to show each of these and what we do. The right coronary artery, the LAD, and the circumflex. There's catheters that fit. These are all catheters um, that we use at different times. The ones that have these heavy-duty beds are more likely to have complications. The classic ones are the JR4 and the JL4. You'll hear that phrase over and over again. This fits the right, that fits the left. You can see because the way they're shaped, they're going to reach out and try to get the coronary artery. When I do a radio cath, I'm proud to say I use one cath there, so I don't have to take it in, take it out, and I can spin the catheter, although it involves a little bit more risk, and I can get both of the coronary arteries with that catheter so I don't have to move a catheter back and forth, and I get all the imaging done. And when these go really, really smooth, and I get in and out, and we can literally do a coronary injury in 10 to 15 minutes. Now, it takes longer for some patients to get on and off the table, get stuff done, and actually have the angiogram done, but we want to make sure everything's safe. Here's an example of a catheter being advanced into the left coronary artery. You can just slide it forward and it just pops in there. If it's too small, they bounce back on itself, so we use a larger one. Here's a right coronary catheter. This involves a little work because when it gets down there, you have to rotate it 180 degrees. And that sounds really obvious, but if you're not careful, you can cause a coronary dissection. And we've seen those over the years, and those can be catastrophic. So the right coronary artery comes off, as I said, it travels down into the back of the heart and gives off marginals and something called PEA, and it gives off these posterior lateral branches. The left main coronary artery comes off and gives off two big arteries, the LAD and circumflex. And this LAD gives off branches called the vagals, and the circumflex gives off branches called the ONs, and together, that's how you get all the coronary arteries. And to do that, the C arm, which is that thing that shaped like a big C, spins around the patient, so we can get coronary arteries, and you'll hear us always say RAO or LAO, which stands for right anterior oblique or left anterior oblique. That's how we're spinning the camera right to left, in cranial or caudal, whether it's the camera up or down. Because you can't see the coronary arteries in just one view. Um, it would be, I'll give you an example. Um, here is a container of Windex. If I do it this way, it looks wide. If I go this way, as I'm moving on Zoom, it shows nothing. That's actually perfect for Zoom. So depending on how I spin it, it shows if it's thick or if it's thin. Because coronary artery disease doesn't develop as a round thing. It develops as an elliptical or crescenteric appearance. So you need to see things in what we call orthogonal views, or 90 degrees. And that's the art of doing what we do. So here's just a picture of a left coronary artery coming down, thus going to the back on the circumflex. And this is the LED going down the front. And here is the same vessel you're seeing, excuse me, with the circumflex and that LED the two arteries going down and around. Here's the same vessel, now looking at a different view, the LAD going down here, that's this vessel up here, and the circumflex going down the round of the back. So here it looks like this triangle the, with those three branches, and here, sorry, it looks completely different because you're looking at it from different angles. The right coronary artery, we look at typically in two views. Here it looks straight down, you can't see the distal vessel, which is really important. So we take another view, and now we see the distal vessel looks like a big C. So once again, looking at different views, you see different coronary arteries. So I put in a slide here called fractional flow reserve. For those of you who've had transplanted a long time ago, 
Or for those of you who got a bad heart, it's like, oh, because of heart came coronary disease, you may have developed premature coronary artery disease. And for that reason, before, it used to be that we put in balloons instead of fixings, but as you're all aware, there's all that news and doctors doing what they should do and sticky instead of what they should. There's probably some truth to that around the country. We take a lot of pride in this. And if somebody doesn't have a good story, you need to really prove that they're having that their coronary artery is the problem. You don't want to start sticking an angioplasty or a stent in someone not helping them, and they create a new problem of stenosis. And so we take a wire and pass it down. That's a green tracing. The red is measured at the tip of the catheter, right here. Would be the red. We pass the wire down here, and then we measure the pressure down here. As you can imagine, if there's a significant narrowing here, the green will drop compared to the red. And we measure the ratio of the mean pressure of one to the other. So the ratio of the green to that yellow, if it's less than more than 25%, or the FFR is less than 0.75 when we give a drug, that means it's significant because there's not enough blood getting down there. The pressure should be identical. So that's how that works. Ibis. Okay. Lots of controversy on the topic of Ibis. My colleagues and I are not all on the same frequency on this. And uh, without getting into all the logistics about this, I'll explain to you what IVIS does. And before you start, let me just reference for everybody, because since everybody on here knows an IVIS, even though they may not know, know the term itself. So just to remind folks, in fact, I think you're going to talk about like when we actually, standard protocol for us. Yeah, I'm going to actually show, I'm actually going to define exactly what that means if you just watch this slide. Great. So what you see isn't always what you get. The whole idea being there's more to the picture than what you're seeing. And what intravascular ultrasound does is give us a different picture. I don't know if this is going to work or not. It appears that it's not. Oh, hang on. One second. Can you give me one minute? Yeah. While he's doing that, um, and uh, let me know when you're ready. Uh, but just as a reference for folks, you know, typically, I believe, and he'll correct me if I'm off, you know, guys, we'll have an IVIS, you know, uh, I think it's maybe a month afterwards. And I know we certainly traditionally have had them about a year after uh, transplant, just as a little time frame for you. And uh, there's actually, if you're interested in what he's talking about to the next degree, there's a NOVA special about how that was developed. Uh, and you can actually just do a Google search on on uh, IVIS or intravascular ultrasound and uh, and Nova, and you'll you'll see a whole whole documentary on that how it was how it was developed. So anyway, while he's doing that, I want to remind folks: if you have a question about what he's talking about, feel free to post it in the Q and A or the chat. I'm monitoring both. And um, Dr. Berger, can I call you back at this number just a little while? Or can you call me in what or can you actually call me back in 30 minutes? Thank you very much. Okay, but if you actually do 15 minutes, it'll probably work too. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. I apologize. No problem. Okay, I wouldn't want to be the person on the table waiting either. So I'm trying to see the Zoom is okay. One of them is going to work. So, can you see this yet? Right now, we still see you. Hey, one second. Let me share the screen again. Okay. I wanted to share with you what the IVIS looks like and how it does it, but I don't think it's going to play. I'm just trying it again. One second. The video, the first video is not working, but the second one appears that it will. One minute. It's trying. I see it. There we go. 
Are you seeing the arrow? Yes. So if you look at the picture on the left, you can see that this is the coronary. It looks quite normal here. But when you look at it, all this here is plaque. And the reason this is hard to tell is the whole vessel has plaque up and down, and you have no reference point. And therefore, you would never know this coronary artery disease here, other than the fact the vessel, when I look at it, it looks a little bit smaller than it should. And so intravascular ultrasound gives us that additional, oh, there we go. Okay, we'll let this play. This is, well, <laughs> the eye is coming back. Is it playing for you now? Kind of going back and forth a little bit. Yeah. There we go. Now different we're going sequences at the arrow at different places. So what's happening here is this patient has plaque in all these places. And I'm going to show you when you put this coronary artery in cross-section what it's actually doing. Here is from three different places of the coronary artery, all of which look normal, but obviously are not normal. And when you look at it, you can actually see the plaque on the ibis. The red is the lumen, which is normal. The yellow is the plaque, which is abnormal. But you would not have seen that with the angiogram. So all of this gets missed with the angiogram. All right? So that's what IVIS does. There's one study that's the basis of all of this, which is a relatively small study, and it was published almost 15 years ago. But they looked at IVIS one month and 12 months, which is what we do, and they looked to see for patients in whom there was gain in the maximal intimal thickness of 0.5 millimeters in that thickness of the yellow. And in those patients who had that, they had worse prognosis. Now, I don't want people walking away from here scared and saying, Doc, what are you doing about this? This is one study, but it's the basis for why intravascular ultrasound is done the way that we do it. And that's because patients who have rapidly progressive vasculopathy do worse than those who do not. I hope that's clear. So left ventriculography is when we pass the catheter into the aortic valve and into the left ventricle. We inject contrast in the left ventricle and the contracting chamber uh, rapidly opacifies. And then we do comparisons in the left ventricle at the end of systole and diastole. And that permits evaluation of wall motion and overall ejection fraction. So here is the ventricle filling and when it squeezes. In general, we get this information from echo now, so it's very rare that I do an LV ram. It has contrast, so I don't want to hurt somebody's heart by going to an echo. I'm not really caring about the cost issue. I'd rather do that, but I don't expose the patient to any risk. But these are two different views of the ventricle in diastole, where it's resting, and in systole, where it's squeezing. And the difference between the two of those, you can calculate the ejection fraction, because the ejection fraction is the proportion of blood squeezing out. Normals, 60 to 65. I'm sorry, normal, 55 to 60. So we calculate this by looking at the difference between the volumes, which is the stroke volume, the difference between your end diastolic, which is when it's resting, and end systolic is when it's contracting. The difference is called stroke volume and the amount of blood that you pump out. And if you divide that by what you start with, the end diastolic value, that fraction is called the ejection fraction. We use the words hyperkinesis to describe when the wall is squeezing extra strong, hypokinesis when it's weak, akinesis, these are all Latin, doesn't move at all, and this kinesis is bad. That's like if somebody's had a heart attack, the rest of the heart squeezing, and that one wall is ballooning out. It can become aneurysmal. Just briefly, this is what we do with things called angioplasty or stents, atherectomy. These are all devices. If you see with the angioplasty, we put a balloon in over a wire, inflate it and deflate it. Sometimes there's a stent on there. And if so, once we take the balloon out, the stent is what's left. <coughs> we do drilling with atherectomy, either rotational or orbital atherectomy. That's a drill bit that spins at a very, very high speed, 140,000 rotations per minute. So if you think about this, if you're gunning your car at five, right, this would be roughly 28 times the speed of what you're doing to your car. And so you can understand why you can have complications. If the, this is over a wire with a protective feature that doesn't let go over, if you did this move forward, it would essentially tear the coronary artery apart within the microsession, microsecond. So all this equipment is very, Interesting, very high tech, and a lot of effort goes into maintaining safety. Laser 
is a whole different concept where we can essentially do ethereoblation, getting rid of tissue, uh, totally different. It's used, uh, we use it at the university for pacemaker lead extraction. So we, to do this, we put a gunny catheter, which is larger than the diagnostic, and we advance over through the sheath, which I told you about before, into the aorta, and then the tip goes, seats in the coronary artery at the osteo. Then we pass a wire through that, and then we manipulate the wire and try to cross the nary, which is easier said than done. And then we pass balloons or stents over the lesion to open it up. And these balloons are hollow tips that go over the wire. And then we inflate the balloon from outside, dilating it a very small amount. These are balloons are literally just millimeters. These are coronary arteries are up to about four to five millimeters. And so we dilate it, and then it's not satisfactory. We can either repeat that, put a stent in, get with a new balloon. Finally, when it's all done, the case has to be over, unfortunately, and you guys got to go home. We take the sheaths out with either manual pressure or what I do with a hema band on the wrist. If we go from the leg, we use closure devices. I don't use them all the time to transplant patients because I know that from seeing anatomic slides, you get a little bit of scarring in there, but it, there's no yay or day that it should be this way or it should be that way. In general, these devices are tolerated pretty well, and uh, they don't improve vascular complications, they don't really reduce it, they make life a little bit easier for the patient and for us. And with that, two minutes ahead of schedule.